Megan stopped taking any jobs and chose to stay at home with her family, but she was a bit curious about the drama that suddenly came out because of the divorce. Mr. Wilson, I want a divorce, Megan asked. Is it a real thing and Daniel is directing it? Yes, we have to make one or else the people will start talking about it, Connor explained. Wow, Megan exclaimed at how capable Connor was at solving sudden problems. After they finished their dinner, Megan asked Connor to bring her to meet Madeline. Madeline was set in a small apartment with guards around her. Mr. Trevor, Madeline said instinctively when she heard the door open, but the people who came in were not Trevor but Megan and Connor instead. The moment Megan laid her eyes on Madeline, she could not hide her surprise, as every part of Madeline was the same as her. She was even surprised that Connor could notice it. This is Madeline? Megan asked Connor. Yes, she's a clone made from your cells, Connor explained. That's why she has the same looks as you. She even managed to trick me at the beginning. Megan walked towards Madeline to have a better look. Madeline knew of the situation she was in. She was a clone, and once she was found out, she had no use for Trevor anymore. But she still had a little hope as she fell onto the floor and begged, Please, can you let me go? Where do you want to go? Megan asked. Back to Mr. Trevor. Megan turned to look at her husband in surprise, as they never thought a clone could feel. Madeline was loyal to the master she served, and now she wanted to go back to him, but it was something that she could never happen. What are you planning to do with her? Are you going to lock her up forever? Megan asked once they left. For the moment, yes, Connor replied. She might be of use to us someday. Connor knew that a fierce battle between him and Trevor could not be avoided, and Madeline might be of use when that happened. I see. Let's go back. I want to check up on Orange and her kid. They went back to Brooklyn Heights and went straight to room 103. As soon as James opened the door, they could hear the baby crying. The baby was lying on the huge bed in the bedroom, where Olivia was beside him trying to put the diaper on. But no matter how hard Olivia tried, she could not succeed, and the baby pooped all over the bed. James, Olivia cried, help! James rushed into the room. Seeing her in a flustered state, he quickly took over. Don't worry, let me do it. James dealt with the stains on the child skillfully and then cleaned and applied the diaper cream on the child before putting a new diaper on the little guy. All was well now. The little guy was already feeling comfortable and was no longer crying. He was now lying quietly in his crib. Megan walked in, laughing as she exclaimed, My goodness, you've transformed a devil into an angel in an instant. How did you do it? James's face turned deep red. He gave an awkward chuckle before hurrying off with the dirty clothes to wash them. Olivia noticed that Megan had arrived. Megan? Is that you, Megan? You finally come back. The two sisters hugged for a while. When they released each other, Megan said, I want to see my godson. Oh my, he has grown up a lot after not seeing him for a month. He's also beginning to have a look. Now that I see him, he's really beautiful, just like his mom. I also think he looks a little better than when he was first born. Yeah, you've taken care of him well. Megan extended a finger to play with the child's tiny hand. Kai grabbed her finger immediately. His grip was quite strong. Oh, look, little Kai has caught me. His grasp is really tight. Yeah, he's quite strong. Olivia's thoughts and focus were now fully on the child. As she looked at her son, a gentle smile involuntarily appeared on her face. Thinking of James, who was busy outside, Megan said deviously, Orange, I think you're quite lucky now. You have James by your side to help you. You don't have to worry too much. Yeah, if there were no James, I would definitely be a mess now. Olivia had not realized this about herself, that she was very dependent on James now. If he was not there for her, she was really not going to make it. Yeah, James is a good young man. He's a practical and capable person, and he has a strong sense of responsibility. I think if he were to become Kai's father, he'd be more than qualified for it. 
Olivia's face froze all over when she suddenly heard Megan say this. Megan, stop saying such things. I really don't have such ideas. I know I'm just saying and I didn't ask you to do anything. I just wanted to remind you that you should think more about Kai. He will eventually grow up and will need a complete family. After finishing her words, Megan resumed playing with the child. Olivia fell silent. She understood everything Megan had said, but to ask her to let go of Dazi and put herself in the arms of another man, uh, she didn't think she could do it. James, that man was a really, really good person, but it was also because he was too good she was not willing to pull him down. In the end, Megan asked again, Where have you planned to hold the one-month celebration? I don't plan to. Olivia did not tell her parents that she had given birth to a child secretly. If she were to let them know, they would definitely bring a lot of trouble. The best way was to not tell her family at all before Kai started school. How can you do that? My godson is so cute. He suffered so many sins before coming into this world. We should hold a celebration party no matter what. Just leave it to me. His godmother will organize this for him. We won't make it grand, but at least we still have to invite several of our good friends and share the joy together. Megan decided to take things into her own hands. No matter what Olivia was going to say, she had firmly decided. The one-month celebration was not held at a big hotel, mainly because Megan didn't feel like appearing in public recently. She wanted to spend a few days in peace. Under Megan's arrangements, the party would be held at the apartment Olivia and James were currently living in. On the day that marked one month old for the baby, the freshest ingredients and groceries were delivered early in the morning. Connor had transferred a few cooks from the Howe family house to prepare lunch together. Woody and Layla appeared on room 103's doorstep just before dinner with Kimberly. Other than them, Harvey's family, Samantha, Adam, Travis, and Lily were all invited. They all came to have a look at the baby and to give their blessings to him. Since Layla liked babies a lot, she spent most of her time playing with the baby. Mr. Woody, look at how cute he is, Layla smiled. Why don't we make one too? Having a little kid calling us daddy and mommy seems fun, right? Who wants to make one with you, Woody scolded. If you want one, then go make it with someone else. So you plan on having a child-free family? Fine, if you don't want one, then we can be a family. My sister is one too, and look at how happy she is with her hubby. Mind your own business, Woody scolded, unable to understand, since when did he show that he wanted to become a family with her? Woody was almost at his limit of having Layla treat herself as his wife. Megan had prepared a lot of food, and lunch was about to begin when the doorbell rang. Is there anyone else coming? Megan asked. I'll go, James said and got up. But as soon as he opened the door and saw who it was outside, he almost had a heart attack. Mom, why are you here? James's mother was standing right outside. She'd come straight up to the suite by using the ID James had given her a while back. To see you, of course. The woman in her 50s smiled while she picked her luggage up. At least let me know beforehand, James mumbled. Do I have to inform the president before and visiting my son? James's mother scolded and went straight into room 103. Oh my, I can smell some food. Did you prepare something for me? Wait, mum. James was trying to stop his mother, but it was too late. As soon as his mother stepped into the house, she was shocked by the huge number of people gathered there. Oh my, why are there so many people here? Are you having a party? James was already speechless and quickly explained, I'm sorry, my mom visited suddenly. No worries, Megan smiled. We can have lunch together too. James took his mother to clean her hands and went back to the dining room. Thank you for the food, James's mother said to Megan as she scanned the people in the room. Connor was the only one she knew and she said, I know this is Mr. Wilson, my son's boss. Nice to meet you, Connor greeted. James's mother landed her eyes on Megan and exclaimed, What a pretty lady. She looks like a huge movie star or something. Mom, she is a movie star. James smiled at Riley. She's the protagonist in the show you told me about, Beauty of the World.
My, this is really unexpected. I really like her. The old woman took Megan's hand as she looked at her over and over again. Megan chatted with the old woman for a while. She didn't expect that she would have such an elderly fan herself. What is this lunch gathering for today? The old woman asked again. Alice, who was next to her, answered in the adult's head. Grandma, this is a one-month celebration for my little brother Kai. A one-month celebration? At this moment, Olivia, who had just breastfed Kai, came out of her room and shouted for James. James, the child pooped again. Can you help me? Oh, I'm going to help. Mom, you stay here. James hurried off to Olivia with the child. Mrs. James was curious. Just now, that woman had come out of her son's room and called him to help with the child. What does this mean? Where did the child come from? Wanting to see what was going on, the old woman followed after him. Inside the room, James was changing a child's diapers while the child's mother watched him from the side. No matter how astute Mrs. James was, she was still surprised. She asked in shock, James, whose child is this? Only then did Olivia notice that there was a woman standing at the door. Slightly dumbstruck, she asked James, who was the auntie at the door? At this point, if James said the child was not his, things would be difficult to explain as both mother and child were staying in his apartment. He was also afraid that his mother would criticize Olivia unfairly. He could only brace himself for it. He directly wrapped an arm around Olivia's shoulders and said, Mom, I've been hiding this from you and did not tell you. This is my wife, Olivia. Our child has just reached one month old. Olivia was shocked. What did he say? Seeing that Olivia was dumbstruck, James squeezed her shoulder secretly and signaled her with his eyes to cooperate with him for a while to put on an act in front of his mother. Olivia vaguely figured out what was going on. As James looked at her imploringly, she had no choice but to nod at his mother reluctantly. Mrs. James was thunderstruck. She couldn't believe it at all. She looked at Olivia and then at the fair and chubby little child. Who would have thought that her hard-headed eldest son had actually married a wife and had a son without saying anything? Suddenly, joy appeared on her face as she rebuked him. Oh, you slow-witted, stupid son. You didn't even tell your family that you've gotten a wife. Why didn't you say anything when the child was born? The child is already one month old. If I hadn't come today, I wouldn't have known such a big thing. Oh, just look at the way you handle things. You'd rather hide such a good wife and grandson from me. Mrs. James had no doubts about it all and had really thought that her son had settled down with a family of his own outside without telling his parents. Now that the elderly woman had seen her fair and chubby grandson, she was overflowing with joy. Seeing that the old woman was constantly calling her son her darling grandson, Olivia had no choice but to continue to play along, helping James to finish the act. Ever since Mrs. James had come, James's life had been a lot easier. His elderly mother was very good at taking care of a child and also very skillful in postnatal care for her daughter-in-law. Olivia and her child were very well cared for by her. However, since the old woman was living here, there was also one big problem. That was, her stay had seriously interfered with Olivia and James's lives. The two had usually slept in separate rooms, but now for the sake of putting on an act in front of the old woman, they had to sleep in the same room at night. In front of Mrs. James, they also had to display their love for each other as husband and wife. As they kept up the act, Olivia felt that she was going to qualify as a professional actor. Mrs. James lived here for more than half a month before James found an excuse to make his mother go back to their hometown in the Northeast. Before leaving, Mrs. James kept reminding him to bring his wife and son back to his hometown when the child was a hundred days old so that their relatives and neighbors could see that the James family finally had a descendant. Yon Yon, what should I do? Olivia asked. I think his mom is serious. She even asked us to bring the kid back home and have a wedding there. What is happening right now? 
Even though Olivia was nervous, Megan thought that they were making good progress. If Olivia were to really be one with James, not only would Megan have to stop worrying about her friend, but Kevin would even be able to rest in peace. James was a gentleman, and he was the nicest towards Olivia and her baby. Why don't you just go with the flow, Megan suggested. You can have someone take care of you, and in return, you can help shut James's relatives up from asking when he wants to get married. But James, I don't know. Olivia believed that a great person like James should find a better woman to live the rest of his life with, and not someone like her who already has a child. I know, but I'm not asking you to do anything. It's just for show. You can still remain friends in secret while lying to the world that both of you are married, Megan explained. I've already talked with James, and he does not mind you having had a relationship with another person in the past or having a child. He's willing to take care of you and the baby without asking for anything in return. I really believe that Kevin is living inside of him or else I can't find any other explanation as to why he was so nice to you. Olivia thought about it and just as Megan had mentioned, Olivia did sometimes see a lot of Kevin and James. After thinking through it, Olivia finally agreed to fake marriage and was set to go back to Connor's hometown in two months. And just a few days after the party, Connor and Megan got an invitation to Daniel and Audrey's wedding. Since the wedding was not far away, Connor and Megan decided to bring the kid together and treat it as a honeymoon for themselves. I'll let the others know, Megan said, and opened the group chat that had all of her friends in it. Group notice, we're going to Hawaii to attend Daniel and Audrey's wedding tomorrow. Let us know if anything happens after we return to New York. But as soon as Megan sent the notice out, the group burst into a discussion. Layla, wait, are you going to Hawaii? I want to go too. Mr. Woody, let's go on a romantic vacation. Mr. Lee, sure thing. Connor has already prepared his private jet. Autumn leaves. At Layla, I'm not going. Layla, no, come with me. I don't want to be lonely. Autumn leaves. Leave me alone. Angry emoji. Chris, Megan, I've also received Director Daniel's invitation. Please help reserve good seats for me. Let's plane pool together. Thanks. Hayden, don't reserve seats for me. I have no time to go. Chris, you dare not to go? Believe it or not, I'll teach you a lesson. Hayden, sticker of a bloodied knife. Chris, I'm wrong, dear. Please punish me however you wish tonight. Hayden, get lost. Since everyone seemed eager to travel and Megan felt like inviting her friends to Audrey's wedding to liven up the party too, she might as well issue an assembly order in the group chat. Mr. Wilson is having a big treat for everyone. A luxury tour to Hawaii, food, accommodations, and return flight included. Those who are interested, sign up now. And so this was how a big group of people had shown up to fly in the private plane the next day. Those who had said they were not coming ended up being persuaded to come by their significant others. When it came to travel, the most excited ones were the children. Alice was happy that she was able to travel with her parents again. What made her very happy this time was that Patrick and his family had come too. She could play with Patrick together. Everyone was here and they all shut down their electronic devices. The plane officially took off. Not long after the plane flew away, a private passenger plane flying in from another country landed at the New York airport. The cabin door opened and a noble and mysterious man got off the plane with a group of people surrounding him. Ever since he saw the film landscape that day, Henry had always wanted to come to New York to look for Megan to confirm some things. But every time he was about to come over, there would be a variety of situations happening around him. It wasn't until today that he had free time to fly over here. As he was traveling privately, President Henry kept himself very low-key. After getting off the plane, he got in his exclusive car and made his way towards the International Hotel where he was going to stay. When he arrived at the hotel, he did not take a rest. He immediately ordered Finn, invite Megan in my name. I want to talk to her in private. Yes, Your Excellency. 
After receiving his orders, Finn went off to contact Megan. However, in New York, he could not find out where Megan and her family lived. He could only go to the entertainment company she was under to locate her. Very unfortunately, the front desk of Jingyu Entertainment told him that Megan had not accepted any jobs lately and her itinerary was not clear. Do you have Megan's number? I'm sorry, I can't disclose her private number to you. Then do you have her manager's or her assistant's contact information? <laughs> These should be fine to disclose. The front desk gave Finn a number, which was Megan's assistant's, Kimberly's. After getting the number, Finn made the call, but the other party had switched off her phone. What was he going to do if he couldn't contact her? It had been difficult for his president to take some time off to come due to his busyness. If he ended up not being able to see Megan, wouldn't that be very frustrating? God knows how many of his brain cells were killed for the sake of locating Megan. He inquired everywhere before finally going to the Wilson family mansion. Unfortunately, they told him that they did not know where Megan was. Damn it, after searching for her painstakingly, it seemed that she was not in New York. Great. Where else could he look? Without success, Finn returned and reported to the president dejectedly. I am sorry, your excellency. I failed you. I could not find Megan. Uh, forget it. Go find out Michael's whereabouts now. Yes, your excellency. Finn obeyed and went to investigate. Michael was easily found. It didn't take long for Finn to find out that Michael was currently living in an asylum in the suburbs of New York. Whether or not Michael was a madman, Henry had to meet this man. Would this man, who had once married Christine, know the whereabouts of her children? Michael was sitting on his bed, scratching his legs. The door was suddenly flung open and in came a group of men in black suits which made Michael jump. He was wary of the people who suddenly visited because he had no idea what they wanted with him, until a man in a pair of leather shoes and a bespoke suit walked in. The man had a mysterious and powerful look in his eyes as if he was above everyone else. The moment Michael saw the man, he knew that he was in danger. The man signaled for all of his guards to wait outside except for Elijah. Michael, the man shouted as if he was from hell. As soon as Michael heard his name, he thought the devil had come from him. He began to wonder if the man was his former boss, Gabrielle. Michael had only seen the back of Gabriel and never saw his face. That was why he mistook the man in front of him as his former boss. He thought that his former boss had come to save him. Gabriel, please save me. Get me out of here. Even though Michael was not insane, he was already at his limit from being locked in an asylum. He would really turn insane if he were in there any longer. He tried to hug the man's leg but was kicked away by Elijah the moment he closed in on the man. Henry looked at Michael from above. Do you know who I am? Henry asked as soon as he heard Michael call him Gabriel. You're Gabriel. Please get me out of here. I don't want to stay with these idiots any longer, Michael said. Henry never expected to hear the name of the man he hated the most from Michael's mouth. Henry had already guessed that the person who ruined his relationship was Gabriel ever since he saw Landscape. It seemed to Henry that Michael had mistaken him for Gabriel, but he did not tell Michael just yet. Do you still remember what I ordered you to do? Henry asked. You have to tell me since I can tell if you're the real Michael or not from your ruined face. You gave me a huge sum of money and wanted me to marry Christine at all costs. You also told me that I can do anything to her other than having sex with her. I did what you asked and I tortured her at least three days a week. After hearing what Michael had just said, anger filled Henry's head as he gripped his fist tightly. He had no idea that Christine had suffered such humiliation after going back to New York. Gabriel was the one who ruined her life and made Michael torture her. So you never had sex with her for the whole six years? No, no, I absolutely did not. Even if you were to give me tens of thousands of bits of courage, I still wouldn't dare. Michael was prostrated on the ground like a lowly ant. 
Henry felt a wave of pain in his chest. He always thought that little Moon would have a happy life after marrying someone else, but who would have thought that her marriage had turned out to be a conspiracy and furthermore cost her life? Holding back his sorrow and his heart, Henry asked again, When Christine married you that year, was she pregnant? Was it a pair of twins? It, yes, yes, they're, they're twins. Where are the two children now? Michael did not dare to speak anymore. He was afraid that he would be punished by his boss. When he had secretly sold the child, he had done it without his boss's knowledge. Seeing that Michael was not talking, Henry narrowed his eyes and took a deep breath. Before he could speak, Finn went up to Michael and began to beat him up viciously. Are you talking or not? Are you? Michael was spitting blood after being beaten up. I... I'll talk. Finn shoved him away. Michael struggled to lift his face. It was so swollen like a pig's head. There's... there's a boy and a girl. I sold the boy when he was born. The girl... the girl has grown up. She is now called... Megan. So Megan was indeed his daughter, and the boy he had actually sold him? Henry decided to deal with him personally. He grabbed Michael's collar with his white-gloved hands savagely and demanded, Who did you sell him to? Lady White Tea. Who is Lady White Tea? I... I don't know. I really don't know. Damn you, animal. Henry was completely enraged. His eyes seethed with a strong, murderous aura. Like a polar storm, his powerful fist struck Michael in the face. As soon as the punch hit his face, blood sprayed from Michael's mouth and a few of his teeth were knocked out. Before he could react, the man's fist and feet came in full force, launching terrible blows at him. Finn, who was standing at the sides, was dumbstruck by what he saw. As a leader of a country, President Henry had always given him the impression of a gentle, wise, and calm man. No one had ever seen the president's terrible temper, and no one had ever seen the president beating up someone before. But today, the enraged president had taught Michael a lesson in a brutal manner, renewing Finn's views of the president. It turned out that his president also had a bloody side. Henry vented the anger in his heart by force. He wanted to rip Michael into a million pieces very badly. When he had beaten Michael until he could no longer get up, only then did he fling him away. Surrounded by a thick air of foulness and forebodingness, Henry took off his blood-stained white gloves, no longer looking at the man on the ground. When he turned around, he told Finn, "'Settle this more cleanly. I don't want him to live past twelve o'clock.' "'Yes, Your Excellency.' Finn obeyed, guaranteeing that he would finish the task the president had appointing him with outstandingly. The president had told him not to let Michael live past 12 o'clock, so that meant that he must die before 1159. After leaving the asylum, Henry went to the cemetery. When he looked at the photo of the woman's youthful face on the tombstone, he felt an indescribable heartache. Pain and remorse spread in his heart ceaselessly. Recalling the plot and landscape, Christine was forced by Gabriel. In order to protect Henry, she had no choice but to leave him. After all, everything was a conspiracy by Gabriel. He had separated him and Little Moon by force and also tormented her for six years. Gabriel had done this to retaliate against him, ruining his most beloved woman for his revenge. My Little Moon, how much did you have to suffer for me? Looks like I'll have to pay you back in our next life. Wait for me. We'll be together forever once I finish what I have to do. Henry sat in front of Christine's grave until night fell, thinking of everything he had with Christine. The memory swarmed his mind as if they were waves almost drowning him. He sat there until Elijah came over and said, Sir, it's about time we leave. Henry got up and touched Christine's gravestone as if he was touching her face. Little Moon, our daughter, is very successful now. She even won the Best Actress Award, Henry said. And as for our son, don't you worry, I'll find him. And one day, we'll come to visit you as a family. Henry went back to the hotel and back to California the next day. After ten hours of flight, the private jet landed at the International Airport. 
Megan and her companions went straight to the luxurious hotel Daniel had prepared for them. They were there two days before the wedding so they could get used to the jet lag. Connor had been taking care of Megan and Alice the whole trip, so Megan was not tired at all. Since Alice wanted to go to the beach, she packed her stuff and left the hotel. Even though New York was still chilly in March, Hawaii was so much warmer. They stopped by the beach and the kids played. Megan, Connor, Harvey, and Jenna rested under a huge umbrella. Their eyes never left the kids who were playing not far away. Patrick, I want a huge castle, Alice said. She was wearing a cute sky blue skirt and running around the beach without anything on her feet. Okay, I'll buy the biggest one for you, Patrick said and began to pile up buckets of sand. Patrick worked fast and in no time had built a very delicate and pretty sand castle for Alice. Alice, look, the castle is done. It's so pretty. Patrick is the best. I now pronounce you the castle's princess. From now on, your princess peach. And which one is the princess's room? This one, Patrick said as he pointed at a random place. But there's no window. Patrick quickly poked his finger into the sand and said, There's one now. Yay! Now I can stay here and look at the garden outside where the dogs are playing. Just as Alice was making good use of her imagination, a beach ball flew over and destroyed the castle. Oh, my castle, sob, sob, sob. When Alice saw the beautiful castle was destroyed, she was so sad that she cried. Megan and Connor heard the child crying and hurried over to investigate. Abe thought that his son had provoked Alice. He asked him indiscriminately, Patrick, didn't I tell you to play with your little sister? Why did you make her cry? Patrick was very innocent. Dad, I didn't make Cherry cry. It was this nasty ball that smashed our castle. The man who had came to retrieve his ball realized that his ball ruined the children's sandcastle, making one of them cry. He immediately apologized to them. When the man left, Patrick coaxed Alice. Don't cry, Cherry. Brother will build you an even bigger castle and make you the world's number one princess, okay? Alice smiled, successfully amused. With tears still on her face, she nodded and said okay. As the sun set, they returned to the hotel and had a buffet dinner at the hotel in the evening. They met up with Daniel and Audrey and asked them about the wedding preparations. The wedding preparations had been completed half a month ago and they were just waiting for the joyous day to arrive after that. It was obvious that Daniel had put a lot of effort into the wedding preparations. He was really regarding Audrey as his precious Trevor, pampering her in his hands. Audrey was nourished by his love every day and she was exuding a glow of happiness and sweetness from the inside out. Originally, Audrey had only asked Megan to be her bridesmaid, but now Samantha, Lily, Kimberly, Layla, and several other girls had voluntarily joined the ranks of bridesmaids. The bridesmaid group and the best man group had suddenly expanded several times. This was also equivalent to giving face to Audrey and Daniel. The wedding day finally arrived. The clean and clear seaside was decorated with fresh and fragrant flowers and purple gauze that danced lightly with the wind. Romance filled the air everywhere. There were also a lot of handsome men and beautiful women wearing beautiful clothes, all of which had become part of the beautiful beach scenery. The wedding of Daniel and Audrey was held here. No media was invited. Only good friends were invited so they could witness their love together. The bridesmaid group today was very special, but in order not to steal the bride's limelight, everyone's bridesmaid dresses were low-key. The two children, Alice and Patrick, acted as their little flower girl and boy. Under the blessings of the priest, Daniel and Audrey completed a romantic wedding. When the two kissed sweetly, everyone gave their sincere blessings. After the wedding was completed, it was time for the bride to throw the flower bouquet. Everyone stood behind and waited for the bouquet to be thrown. Perhaps it was God's will that the flower bouquet went straight to Megan and she caught it. Everyone cheered and whooped, asking when she was going to hold a wedding with Connor. 
Our daughter is already grown up and there's no hurry for the time being. This bouquet should be given to Samantha. Megan immediately shoved the flower bouquet to Samantha. In their excitement, everyone asked when Adam was going to marry her. Adam said surely, I am ready any time. Now all Samantha has to do is nod. Embarrassed, Samantha shot him a look and then handed the bouquet to Lily. Lily was shocked as though she had been handed a steaming hot potato. She immediately threw the bouquet to Layla. When the bouquet reached Layla's hands, she did not continue to pass it to someone else. Instead, she accepted it cheerfully, smiling at Woody as he said, Woody, you see, this is simply heaven's will. In my humble opinion, we should just go with the flow. Now the wedding venue is ready-made, and even the priest is also here. Why don't we get married? It was courageous for a woman to propose, but it also made Woody feel awkward. When people started chanting for him to hug the girl, it made him blush even more. After the ceremony was a trip to the ocean. A few boats were prepared, and each boat would seat a couple. The sky was bright, and the ocean was clear. As the boats passed through the beautiful ocean, no one had expected tragedy to befall them. When Woody's boat was about 80 feet away from the shore, it exploded. The explosion was loud as smoke rose into the sky. It was too sudden for anyone to react as their boats were swept away by the blast. Woody survived the explosion and swam back up to the surface. All he could see were scraps of what his boat used to be and Layla was nowhere to be found. Woody began to think of the possibilities as he felt fear for the first time. It would be traumatizing if the person who was asking you to marry her ended up dead the next minute. The other boats quickly turned back to the shore. Connor and Megan quickly went back out to the ocean to look for survivors. Megan spotted Woody and shouted, It's Woody. He's still alive. We have to get him up. But Woody shouted back, Layla is missing. I'm going to look for her. Woody dived back into the ocean. They weren't sure if Layla could have survived the explosion, but Connor had to do something before the actual rescue arrived, and he dived after Woody. He knew what Woody was feeling. It was the same as when he saw Megan jumping out from the plane. It was fear, worry, and panic. Woody kept coming up for air and diving back down again. When the rescue boat had arrived, both Woody and Connor surfaced with Layla in Woody's arms. Her face was pale and her head was bleeding. Megan performed a quick check and said, She injured her head. We have to stop the bleeding now and get her to a hospital. Because Megan was not sure if the explosion had caused any other injuries, she was reluctant to move Layla around too much. Woody looked at the woman who was lying unconscious in his arm and he could feel his heart hurting. Layla, wake up, Woody shouted. Please wake up. Wake up. You've always followed my orders, so wake up now, please. Woody was hurt in his heart, and it was different from the time when Alice was hurt. He finally realized that he already accepted Layla, that he had already fallen for her. It was his own pride that was stopping him from making the next move. Woody never stopped calling Layla's name, and she finally opened her eyes weakly. Layla, finally! In Layla's brief consciousness, to be able to see her beloved Woody still alive made her feel very good. Woody, I'll not bother you any more in the future. You can go find any kind of woman you like. What the hell are you talking about? I've fallen in love with you since long ago, don't you know? You stupid woman. She finally heard Woody confessing his feelings to her. Her death was worth it. Layla reached out with her fingers trying to touch his face, but blood suddenly spilled out from the corner of her mouth. After coughing violently, she fell unconscious again. Layla, Layla. Woody was going crazy. He held Layla tightly. There were no other moments that were sadder than now. He didn't know what would happen if he were to lose such a woman who loved him so much. What was he going to do? Heartache, sadness, despair and he would not forgive himself forever. The rescue boat sent them to the shore first as the ambulance was waiting there. Layla was taken to the island's hospital. Outside the emergency room, Woody looked helpless and lost. His heart was full of anxiety. He really wished that the injured person was him. He didn't want Layla to be hurt. His friends came to the hospital to visit. Kimberly saw Woody looking very pained, so she comforted him. Brother, don't be too upset. Layla will definitely be fine. 
Woody lifted his reddened eyes and glanced at his sister. He asked, Tell me, am I usually being too fierce to her? Am I such a jerk? Kimberly nodded. Yeah, a little. Woody was regretful for his actions. He punched the wall with his fist and hatred for himself. If Layla were really to just die like that, he would blame himself till the end of his life. God knows how long he had waited anxiously before the emergency surgery was finally completed. At the moment when the doctor came out, Woody and everyone went up to ask him about her situation. The doctor told them very solemnly, the patient's brain was damaged. Now we've already done our best to keep her alive. We'll see if she can wake up within a week. Otherwise, be prepared that she would fall into a vegetative state if she doesn't wake. Even if she does wake up, there will still be after effects. Nobody could imagine what it would be like when an energetic and lively person such as Layla became a vegetative person. Woody fell into great sorrow. Megan patted his shoulder as she comforted him. Woody, sis is a good person. God will surely help her. Who knows, she might wake up tomorrow. Whether she can wake up or not, I will not let go of her again. Right now, he only knew that whether or not Layla would become a vegetative person, he would simply not leave her again. He could still hear her words in his mind when he had gotten the flower bouquet. She had smiled and said that she wanted to marry him. In a blink of an eye, they had almost become separated into two worlds of the living and the dead. Layla, please wake up soon. Didn't you say that you wanted to marry me? As long as you wake up, I'll marry you. At the sea, the police had begun their investigations. The sea area was temporarily barricaded and thorough investigations were being conducted on the yacht rental company. Connor had already given the order to cover up the incident. For the time being, Layla's injury must not be known by their family back in New York for fear that they would become worried. In the hospital, Layla had already gone through emergency treatment after her head was injured by the blast. Her life was recovered, but she had yet to pass the critical period. Woody had been watching over Layla without rest. After surviving the critical period, Layla still remained unconscious and was sent to the intensive care unit. Her friends came to visit her one after another. Daniel and Audrey also came to express their sympathy. They also expressed their regret for this accident happening happening on their wedding day. When Megan and Connor went to visit Layla, Woody remained quiet the whole time. His eyes reflected his regrets and remorse, and the couple knew what he was going through. Humans have the tendency to feel those things only when they've lost the things they took for granted. Woody had not slept for the past two days, and he was in a bad state. His eyes were red, and his beard unshaved. It looked like he could collapse right away. You should get some rest, Megan said. You might collapse before she wakes up. I'm fine. I want to stay by her side, Woody replied as he grabbed Layla's hand. I was a bastard. I really wish I could turn back time and make her right. It's not too late yet, Megan comforted him. The doctor said she will wake up soon, and when she does, treat her better. Woody was thinking of the same thing, too. As soon as Layla woke up, Woody vowed that he would treat her the best he could. But, but it's been seven days. She might wake up tomorrow. And just as Megan finished her sentence, Layla's eyelids and hands moved. Hey! Megan shouted as soon as she noticed it. I think she's waking up. Layla slowly opened her eyes, but quickly closed them again because it was too bright. Layla, Layla, Woody shouted, and Layla opened her eyes again. You're finally up. Woody could not hide his excitement as he grabbed her hand and kissed it. Layla realized her hand was being grabbed by a stranger and tried to pull it back, but she did not have any strength in her body and could not do so. She was troubled, as she had no idea who the man was and why he was grabbing her hand. Thank God, Megan sighed in relief. Layla noticed the pretty lady in front of her, and she also had no idea who the lady was. Who are you? Layla asked as she frowned. The question shook both Megan and Woody as it seemed like Layla could not recognize them. I'm Woody, and she's Megan. Did you forget? No, I don't know either of you. 
No matter how hard Layla tried to remember, she could not recall who either of them was. Megan hurried and called Connor over. Sis, Connor greeted as he entered the room. Connor. Layla finally met a face she was familiar with. Megan and Woody remained silent as they were both puzzled as to why Layla could not recognize them but could recognize Connor. How are you feeling? Connor asked. My head hurts. Layla tried to get up but realized the pain in her head was killing her. Lie down. You're hurt and you need your rest. Woody thought that if Layla was able to recognize Connor, then she could definitely recognize him too. It was just that he had not shaved for a few days. He tidied his messy hair and wiped his face and then came over and grabbed Layla's hand. Layla, take another look at me. I'm Woody. Have you forgotten? Layla withdrew her hand and then hugged her own head, imploring Connor, Brother, my head hurts. Can you please tell these people to get out? She didn't know this man. He was just like a madman going up to her and simply touching her. Considering that she had just woken up, she might need time to adjust herself. Connor had no choice but to ask them to go outside and then call the doctor in to check on Layla. After a doctor came over and checked on her, he said that she was suffering a traumatic after effect. Her hippocampus was definitely damaged and she may have short-term amnesia. It was very normal for her to lose some parts of her memory and not remember the people around her. After hearing such an explanation, Woody was completely in despair. So that means I don't exist in her memory? She has completely forgotten me? Megan comforted. Please don't be sad, Woody. She doesn't remember you, but she also does not remember me either. Was she trying to comfort him? What Woody was sad about was, if Layla could never remember him anymore, how was he going to bring the old Layla back? After Layla's emotions and spirits were stable, Connor took Megan into her ward and asked her to recognize her. Layla, do you know who she is? Layla looked blank. After looking at her for a while, she said with pleasant surprise, Bro, is this your girlfriend? She used to be my girlfriend, but now she's my wife, Megan. Have you forgotten? Layla, Megan called out to her. Layla's reaction was once again surprising. Sis-in-law is so beautiful. When did you two get married? How come I don't remember it? Connor and Megan exchanged looks, guessing that Layla might have forgotten the memories of a certain period of her life. For example, if she couldn't recognize Megan, then it could be speculated that she had lost all the memories after Connor and Megan's meeting. They brought their daughter to Layla and let her see her. Then, do you still remember her? Layla thought for a long time, but she couldn't recognize her. Alice felt hurt. Auntie Three Eyes, how could you forget baby? Did water go into your head? Of course, how could water not have entered her head after she fell into the sea? To her surprise, Layla had accepted the fact that her brother had secretly married a wife and given birth to a child. After seeing their daughter, she expressed how much she adored the child. Oh my god, Anise has fallen from the sky for me. Mom and Dad must be really happy to hear this. Yeah. After that, Connor said a few more things, and it was clear that Layla's memory was stuck in the time one or two years ago. Since Layla could not remember recent matters, they did not force her to recall them. Let's just let things go with the flow. The door of the ward opened again, and Woody entered. He had already gone back to refresh himself. He had already shaved his beard, had a shower, and changed his clothes. He was completely refreshed, returning to his former handsome self. He thought that if Layla saw his usual handsome self, she would definitely remember him. However, when Woody stood before her bed with fresh flowers in his hands, Layla asked Connor, Is this person in the wrong ward? Woody almost vomited blood. He had groomed himself up so finely, and yet she still couldn't remember him. Woody thought that he was the type that Layla liked, and he was confused when she showed no interest in him. Says he's your boyfriend, Connor quickly explained. No way, Layla laughed as she shook her head. There's no way I would get myself a boyfriend. I don't even want to get married. Plus, he's not even my type. It was as if thousands of needles had pierced through Woody's heart as Layla had completely forgotten about him. He was a complete stranger to her.
What made him panic was the fact that Layla mentioned that she wasn't the type she liked. But no matter how panicked he was, no one could help him. The only thing that anyone could do was wait until she regained her memories. The report from the investigation of the explosion showed that it was a terrorist attack. The culprits who were apprehended were terrorists from the dark zone. While most of the people had left Hawaii and gone back to their homes, Megan and her family remained in Hawaii to take care of Layla. When Layla was much better, Connor was about to leave with his wife and kid. Wait, what about me? Who's going to take care of me? Layla asked in a panic when she heard that they were leaving. You still have Woody, right? Who wants that weirdo to take care of them? Layla scolded. Is this mom's plan, trying to force a guy on me when I can't remember anything? She held firm a belief that Woody had been put by her side by her mother so that she could force her to marry. Woody's face was as dark as charcoal as he had become a weirdo in Layla's mind. Uncle Treeleaf is not a bad guy, Alice said when she was about to leave. He'll protect you. I don't need anyone to protect me. I still have a lot of things to do. Layla scolded, remembering that she was still in charge of Talentex Entertainment's PR. I'm giving you a one-month vacation, Connor ordered. Woody will take care of you from today onwards, and you are to listen to everything he says. If you don't, then we have no choice but to set up a wedding once you get back. That kept Layla's mouth shut instantly, as the thing she was afraid of the most was being forced into a marriage. She had gone back to the woman she was, a person who despised marriage. She was being cold towards Woody and rejecting him from the bottom of her heart. Woody was also to blame, and he had never treated Layla well, and now he was tasting his own medicine. Yet he still threw away all his pride and remained next to Layla. There was a reason for Connor's sudden death departure. He had gotten the news that headquarter in Tampa had been attacked by a suicide bomber and she was admitted into the hospital. Several hours later, the plane landed at Tampa Airport. Their group rushed to the hospital where Susan was admitted. When they arrived at the hospital, Susan had already undergone surgery and was now lying in the intensive care unit. Fortunately, she had only suffered a few external injuries and her life was not in danger. Police in Tampa had begun to investigate the cause of the suicide attack. After the investigation, it was confirmed that the incident was caused by local dark forces in Tampa members of the dark zone. It was the dark zone again. Connor made a bold speculation. Was it because Trevor wanted revenge against him that he had deliberately ordered his men to create such a vicious incident, starting from his loved ones? As he thought of his family far away back in New York, Connor could not help but feel anxious. Looks like he had to hurry back to New York to be at ease. After there were no more major problems with Susan, their family of three immediately flew back to New York without delay. Back in New York, the family of three first returned to the Wilson family mansion. Linda had already ordered the servants to prepare a hearty lunch. Now she was just waiting for them to come home to have lunch together. Linda had been standing at the main entrance for more than an hour, craning her neck to look out for them. Jared came over in his wheelchair and teased her. Stop looking for them. You're going to be a giraffe if you continue looking out for them like that. Linda turned around and said, feeling peeved, I'm happy to become a giraffe. I just can't help missing my granddaughter. I'm not like you. You don't even bother to ask about our children after they've been gone for so long. Won't they be annoyed if we ask too much? When they're supposed to come back, they will naturally come back. Okay, okay, I understand. You're such a reassuring person. Despite saying that, Linda still stood in the same place, looking outward anxiously. Not long after, a few figures finally appeared in the shade of the trees. Linda squinted her eyes to look clearly. They're here. Dear, they're back. I see them. Jared looked in the direction she pointed with her finger and saw his son and daughter-in-law arriving with his little granddaughter. The family of three were walking towards them. Linda noticed that only the family of three had come. She did not see Layla. She wondered, how come I didn't see our little Layla? 
It's not like you don't know that she's always not at home. Linda did not ask anymore. When the family of three was nearing, she went up to greet them happily. You are all finally back. Oh, Jerry, come to Grandma. After seeing her grandmother, Alice ran happily to her and plunged into her arms, greeting her sweetly. Grandma... Oh, my precious granddaughter, let Grandma take a good look at you. Have you gotten fatter? Linda hugged her granddaughter happily and then looked down at her. Mm, it seems you've gotten fatter. Uh, your little face has become so round. <laughs> Grandma, Baby has been eating seafood every day, so that's why Baby has gotten fatter. Alice said proudly as she clung onto her grandmother's neck. Mm-hmm. It's good to grow fatter. Best to eat until you're strong and chubby. After kissing her granddaughter, Connor and Megan came in front of her and greeted her. Then they entered the house together. When he saw that his family was well, only then did Connor feel the knot being freed in his stomach. The lunch had been prepared long ago and was already served on the table. After coming back from washing their hands, the family sat down to eat. The family patriarch, Bernard, also came to eat together with everyone. At the dinner table, Linda couldn't help asking why Layla had not come home. Mom, Layla wanted to play in Hawaii for a little longer. She will take care of herself, don't worry. Connor would not dare say anything about his sister's accident in Hawaii, otherwise his aging mother would definitely buy a ticket and fly over there to see what had happened to her daughter. I'm not worried about her. It's just that your sister is no longer young. She's the only one in this family who is unmarried. How can your father and I not be anxious? I'm not, Bernard said, making Linda stare at him angrily. In truth, Linda was worried that her daughter, who was well over 30 years old, might not be able to get married. She has Woody, and he's taking really good care of her, Connor explained. Are they even real? When I met Woody last time, it didn't seem like he had any interest in your sister, Linda replied, as Woody had not left a good impression when she last met him. No, he really likes her. You just have to sit and wait for their wedding. That made Linda calm down a little, but only just for a while, as Jesse's problem still remained unsolved. Connor, is there any news on your big sis? Linda asked. Can't you find someone to look for her? I've already found her, but she said she's not planning to come back. Don't worry, she'll come back once she's thought it through. Connor had indeed already found his sister, but she refused to go back to New York, as both Xavier and Chester were still looking for her. She did not want to meet either of them for the time being. I don't know why, but I have a bad feeling something might happen to us shortly. Linda mumbled, worried about her children. You might be tired. You should get more sleep, Connor said, keeping the incidents that had happened to both of his sisters from her. You're right. I might be overthinking it. Megan, here, try some of the fish I made, Linda said as she placed a piece of fish on Megan's plate. Linda had really changed a lot, and she really cared for both Alice and Megan a lot. The only thing she wished was that Megan could give her another grandchild. Thank you, Megan said, putting the fish in her mouth, but she spat it out right away and coughed heavily. What's wrong? Are there bones in the fish? Connor asked as he helped her by patting on her back. No, my stomach doesn't feel well. Here, have some tea, Connor said as he poured a cup of hot tea for her. Wait, Linda stopped Megan from drinking the tea. Connor raised his head to look at his mother, wondering why she stopped Megan from drinking the tea. Linda thought of a possibility and smiled. Megan, could it be that you're pregnant? Megan had never thought about it, but Linda's words made her think. She had been very tired in recent days, and her periods were late. You're pregnant? Connor asked as he looked at her full of surprise. Even the two elders, Bernard and Jared, were very pleasantly surprised to hear the news. The most pleasantly surprised was little Alice. She lifted her head and asked, blinking her big eyes, Is mommy giving birth to a little brother for me? I don't know. It can't be. Although Megan especially wanted to bear Connor another child, he had always put on protection by right she shouldn't be pregnant. If she was really pregnant, then when did it happen? Could it be the time after she was rescued by Connor after jumping into the sea? Don't you know Chinese medicine? Why don't you check your own pulse and see whether you're pregnant?
Connor urged her to check her own pulse quickly. Megan obeyed and put her right hand over her left wrist. She bit her lip as she began to feel her own pulse, but after feeling for a while, she still felt a bit uncertain. It doesn't seem like it. Maybe she was being so nervous that she was not able to feel her own pulse accurately. You must not be checking it accurately. I'll take you to the hospital for an examination now. Connor immediately got up and left the table, pulling Megan with him as he headed out of the house. Seeing that her son was in a hurry, Linda quickly reminded him, Slow down, Connor. Don't touch Megan's stomach. I know, Mom. Without saying anything, Connor directly picked up Megan in his arms and strode out the door. Megan didn't know what to say. It was not even confirmed whether she was pregnant or not, but everyone acted as though she was confirmed to be pregnant. Daddy, mommy, baby also want to see little brother. Alice also wanted to follow, but Linda stopped her. Her grandmother coaxed her. Cherry, your father is going to accompany your mother to the hospital for examination, and they may not have time to take care of you. Why don't you wait for them at home with your grandma and grandpa and great-grandpa? Okay, then. I hope mommy will give birth to a little brother for me this time. Otherwise, the other children will laugh at me. Alice had boasted to her classmates several times that her mommy was going to give birth to a little brother for her. Later, when her classmates asked her whether her little brother was already born or not, she was embarrassed to speak. Yes, as long as you are a good girl and wait for them at home, your mother will definitely give birth to the most beautiful little brother in the world for you. Yay, okay. I'm going to give my flower dress to my little brother. <laughs> The little rascal's words had amused the adults. Outside, Connor carefully placed his wife in the passenger seat, helped her strap on her seatbelt, and then drove out of the Wilson family mansion. The Connor of today changed his usual speedy driving habits. He was now driving the car very, very carefully. Half an hour later, their car had not yet reached the city's inner ring road. Megan peered at the speedometer in the dashboard. The needle was constantly hovering at 30 miles per hour. She couldn't help but say, Dear, why don't I drive instead? You, you must be joking. Connor was worried that a mishap would happen to her. That was why he had driven the car so slowly. Before it was confirmed whether there was a child in her belly, she still had to assume that there was one. So he had to be careful. It's better to be safe than sorry. Therefore, this very cautious, prospective father had broken a new low-speed record. All the other cars around him overtook his luxury car. Even the old man riding on his motor tricycle was driving faster than him. Slowly, they arrived at First People's Hospital. Connor took Megan directly to Matt. Matt first ordered a urine test. The urine test results came out as faint positive. Great, you're really pregnant, dear. I'm, I'm going to be a father. Connor was so happy that he hugged his wife tightly as tears filled his eyes. Didn't you say you don't want any kids anytime soon? Megan asked with a smile. Of course I want another one, but I was worried that you'd have to suffer from it. I don't want anything to happen to you. That's why I want one, Megan smiled. The thing I wanted to do the most is to welcome the baby with you and let the baby grow up with the father right next to him. Connor was not a selfish person. If his wife did not want a kid, he would never force her. Even if they only had Alice, that would be enough for him. In truth, Connor would also be happy if Megan was the only person by his side. I'll be a good father, I promise, Connor said. But the report mentioned something called a weak positive. What does it mean? Matt explained that since Megan had only become pregnant a few days ago, or perhaps because the test wasn't in the early morning, the result was a weak positive. But Matt assured them that Megan was indeed pregnant, but would still have to undergo a blood test to 100% be sure. And they waited for another half hour for the blood test, and the result was early pregnancy. There's nothing to worry about here, Matt said. Come back in 10 days for an ultrasonography scan. If you have folic acid at home, you can take it until three months before the delivery. 
got it. Megan had already prepared the folic acid, as she had been taking it ever since she planned to have another baby. Congratulations, you're going to be the father of another child soon. Matt smiled as he shook Connor's hand. Thank you. Connor smiled back, his heart melting at the thought of having another baby in nine months. Connor was extra careful on their way out of the hospital. Be careful, there are rocks on the ground, Connor warned. Don't worry, I'm not that weak, Megan smiled. I can even run a 200 meter dash if you want me to. You better not do anything harsh until the baby is born, Connor scolded as soon as he heard her mentioning the 200 meter dash. I will, Megan laughed even harder. You are not allowed to do anything dangerous. Fine, fine. Both of them went back to the Wilson mansion to tell everyone about the good news. Alice jumped up and down when she heard the news. As her wish had finally come true, her mother was going to give her a baby brother. After having dinner at the Wilson family mansion, Connor returned to Brooklyn Heights with his wife and daughter. Originally, Megan wanted to share the good news with Olivia at once, but when she saw that the lights in apartment number 103 were not lit up, she remembered that Olivia had already followed James back to his hometown with her child. It might be a while before she comes back. After they got home and had a bath, the husband and wife laid down on the bed with their daughter between them. Connor stroked his daughter's little head and asked, What kind of story does Cherry want to hear tonight? Alice thought about it for a while before she suddenly had an idea. She got up and leaned close to her mother's stomach and said, Daddy, baby doesn't want to listen to a story anymore. Baby wants to tell a story to little brother. Sure. What story do you want to tell your brother? The couple was pleasantly surprised to hear her say that. They always knew that she was a sensible child, but they didn't expect her to be this sensible. Now she even knew to start loving her brother. A baby is going to tell the story of the three little pigs. Alice cleared her throat and began to tell the story animatedly. She finished one story, but she still wasn't content, so she started a second story. As their daughter was telling the story seriously, Megan and Connor leaned against the headboard of the bed watching the little girl. Megan suddenly said, I feel a strong sense of premonition. What premonition? I feel that after this child is born, he will definitely be spoiled. Megan could imagine it. In the future, this child would be spoiled by his father and his sister all day long. Furthermore, he would be favored by his family, elders, and aunts. It could really be said that he would be loved by many. It's all right. I'm willing to spoil my baby, Connor said proudly. Before his daughter could look back, he quickly kissed his wife on her cheek. Megan shot him a look and smiled. She couldn't describe the sweetness she was feeling in her heart. They rested for the night. The next day, Connor sent the child to school. Megan continued to stay at home, but her holidays were over. She was supposed to start work again. Previously, the drama Let's Divorce Mr. Wilson had entered the casting stage, and most of the cast was selected. The launch of the shooting would be held three days later. Connor knew that she couldn't bear to be idle, but for the safety of her unborn child, he had helped cancel the lead role in this film so she could take care of her fetus at home. In the following period, Connor began his wedding preparations in full force. Megan only needed to cooperate. When the time came, she could just comfortably become a bride. At a wedding photography studio in New York, today they had a wedding photo shoot appointment. Lily and Kimberly accompanied Megan to the studio first to pick a wedding dress and get ready for the studio shoot. In the end, after looking at all the dresses, the three women had their eyes on a specially customized wedding dress. Megan's eyes lit up as she was attracted by this wedding dress with a cut out top. Pleasantly surprised, Lily said, Megan, this is so beautiful. Try this one. Kimberly also agreed. It looks like only this one is suitable for you. Megan also felt that this dress was very beautiful. She said to the staff, 
I'll try this. The staff explained to her on the spot. Mrs. Wilson, you have a really good taste. This is the Elisab wedding dress that Mr. Wilson has specially ordered from you from abroad. It has a nice name called Everlasting Love. She put on the wedding dress. At the moment when the curtain slowly unveiled, Megan stunned everyone in her wedding dress. The perfect combination of exquisite beaded diamond motifs and the lightweight gossamer cloth created a dreamy and romantic look for the wedding dress. The wedding dress was definitely made for Megan and only her. As she put on the dress, she looked like an angel descending from heaven. Oh my god, you're so pretty. Wait, I'll snap some pictures. Isn't Mr. Wilson ready yet? He should see this. And it was then that Connor appeared from behind in his tuxedo, his eyes set on his wife. You're so pretty, Connor exclaimed. She was the prettiest bride in his mind, and no one could even come close to her. Megan raised her head and looked at Connor, who was in his black tuxedo, as if he was a prince from the medieval era. Hubby, are you really my husband? Megan asked, unable to believe how good-looking the man was. Megan's words made the people all around them laugh as Connor walked towards Megan and took her by her hand, leading her into the photo booth. I finally know what a match made in heaven means, Lily sighed. They were really made for each other. Aren't you and Travis the same as them? Kimberly laughed. When are you two going to get married? And which part of us do you see us as a match, Lily scolded. We aren't even in that kind of relationship. We're just an employer and an employee. Kimberly had known both Lily and Travis together from a lot of time, and from the way they talked to each other, Kimberly could clearly see that Travis was interested in Lily. Kimberly even saw them kissing by chance when they were in Hawaii. You don't have to deny it. I even saw you two kissing in Hawaii. Lily was so embarrassed that she wanted to dig a hole and hide in it. When they were in Hawaii, Travis had force kissed her while under the influence of alcohol. That damn bastard, this is so embarrassing, Lily scolded. After Connor and Megan had their photos taken in the booth, the next stop was at the residence. Since the residence was built on an island in the middle of Jade Lake, every corner of the place was suitable for photo shooting. It was the best place for wedding photos. The couple changed their clothes and posed for the camera. Since they were both in the acting industry, posing was not a challenge for either of them. They even reflected their love for each other in all of their poses. They kissed and hugged each other like there was no one beside them. The photos were so natural that any of them could be used for the wedding. Her delicate vest as she said hatefully, I don't want to spread dog food with him. Best not to let me see him, otherwise I'll wallop him whenever I see him. She didn't know what the man who was quietly approaching her from behind had heard everything she said. She didn't want to spread dog food with him. She would wallop him every time she sees him. Travis really didn't know that the girl was so resistant towards him. Back then, when he had kissed her in Hawaii, hadn't she enjoyed it? In order to let the girl know what to say and what should not be said and the consequences of speaking inappropriately, Travis grabbed her head by force as he came from behind and gave her a fiery kiss. Um... Lily was in the middle of a conversation but actually ended up being kissed by someone by force. When she saw the close-up handsome face before her eyes, clearly she felt goosebumps rising on her skin. Her mouth was sealed by his kiss and her body was also hugged by him. She couldn't move. She wanted to beat him with her small hands, but her beatings would feel like a tickle to him. Kimberly saw such an intense scene when she turned around and looked. She couldn't help but laugh and remarked, Are you two trying to kill me? Oh please, I suggest that both of you go somewhere else and kiss all you want. Travis let go of her and Lily was able to breathe. She couldn't help but widen her eyes and curse him. Travis, are you sick? Yep, only you have my cure. The man really listened to Kimberly's words, directly picking up Lily in his arms. Lily screamed in terror when she was lifted off the ground. What are you doing? Let me down. How can a man like you be so unruly? Travis didn't budge. I'm only unruly towards you alone. Who taught you to be so disobedient? But you can't just force a kiss on me in public, you hooligan. 
Hmm, seems like Kimberly's suggestion is good. We can go somewhere else and kiss all we want. Kimberly will be going now. Travis had long realized this. He didn't have to be courteous at all when treating Lily. The more polite he was, the farther she would run. The only right thing to do was to trap her in his sphere of control domineeringly. Ever since Travis forced a kiss on her last time, he'd gotten addicted to doing it. Now he felt like kissing her every day. There was not a single second that he didn't want to. Thus, he ignored Lily beatings and carried her away, planning to look for a clean place to enjoy kissing her. As Kimberly watched them both leave, she couldn't help but smile at them. At this time, a text message came to her mobile phone. She looked down at it. It was Mr. Clay, the lawyer. He was asking her what she was up to. Kimberly sent a photo of beautiful scenery that she had taken just now. Enjoying the scenery. With your boyfriend? I don't have a boyfriend. After answering him with this sentence, he did not reply for a long time. Kimberly was going to stare a hole through the screen. She thought that he was not going to reply. Just as she was about to put down her phone, Clay's message came in. You don't have a boyfriend and I don't have a girlfriend either. Miss, do you think we could try dating each other? Through the screen, she could tell from the humorous tone of Clay's message that he must be very nervous. He must have hesitated for a long time before sending the message. He must be afraid of getting rejected. When Kimberly saw his message, she was so pleasantly surprised that she almost leaped with joy. Since knowing Clay back in California, the two had become especially fond of chatting with each other. They would chat on the phone almost every day, but neither Kimberly nor Clay ever asked the other about their past relationship. They never discussed anything about it, but progress was finally made. Aren't you afraid of being in a long-distance relationship? Kimberly asked. The message showed that Kimberly wanted to be in a relationship with Clay, but also expressed her concerns. I'll go look for you. Send me your address, Clay replied. Let me know when you're coming. I can pick you up at the airport. Kimberly texted back, unable to believe that Clay was planning to visit her in New York. Sure thing. I can't wait to meet my pretty girlfriend. They kept texting each other until Connor and Megan were finished with their photo shoot. After the photographer left, Connor asked a chef to prepare food for everyone that was still on the island. Megan took off her dress and changed back into her original clothes. Oh my god, I'm so tired, Megan complained. Tired? Then let me carry you, Connor said and gave her a piggyback ride. Megan didn't say anything and rested her whole body on his back as they walked out of the bedroom. When they arrived at the garden, only Kimberly was there waiting for them. Where's Lily and Travis? Megan asked. They must be kissing somewhere. Kimberly smiled as she put down her phone. Just as she finished her sentence, Travis and Lily came back hand in hand, while Lily had her head down the whole time. When Lily raised her head, everyone noticed that her lips were a little swollen. Oh my, looks like both of you are giving your best, Megan laughed. Lily was so embarrassed that she wanted to die, wishing that she could kill Travis and get away with it. Travis had kissed her until she was almost suffocating, as she could not feel any strength in her limbs. She began to wonder if Travis had a lot of girlfriends before her because he was too well versed in kissing. But in truth, Travis hadn't had any other girlfriends. He was still feeling pity that he'd only gotten to kiss Lily for 40 minutes and he vowed to find more time to kiss Lily in the future. They left the residence after having their lunch. Connor took Megan back to Brooklyn Heights while Travis was in charge of sending the two girls back home. He sent Kimberly back to her place first. When Kimberly got out of the car and walked towards her apartment, he noticed someone standing in the shadows. She walked closer to see who it was and was surprised by the person standing there. Mr. Clay? The man turned and smiled at her. Long time no see. Why are you here? Kimberly remembered that she had just sent him the address to her place and she thought that he was joking about visiting her. I wanted to give you a surprise, Clay said. After chatting with Kimberly, Clay noticed that he was falling for her. He'd even had a dream the night before where Kimberly was in trouble and he quickly bought a plane ticket to New York. It, 
It really is a huge surprise. Kimberly could not explain what she was feeling at that moment. It was as if she was a maiden in love once again. Kimberly was about to invite Clay back to her place when their path was blocked by a few people. Miss Kimberly, come with us. Mr. Walton wants a word with you. They were obviously sent by Gerald, father of Diana, and it must be about Diana's whereabouts. Kimberly had just come home from hiding for a while. She thought the hounding should be over, yet they were still here. I seriously have no idea where she is. Whether you know or not, you have to come with us and tell Mr. Walton yourself. Take her and let's go. They came for her no matter what. Clay tried to protect Kimberly instinctively. He kicked off the guards and took her to run. The two of them kept running while the guards kept chasing. After a long while with a lot of turning, they eventually got rid of them. They hid in a narrow lane and finally felt safe. The lane was no more than a meter wide. They stood face to face, clinging on to each other. They were both panting heavily after the long run. Their chest heaved drastically, and Kimberly could feel the man's breathing above her head. They were so close that her heartbeat accelerated. We should be fine now. Clay's pleasant voice came from above. Kimberly looked into his alluring eyes. His lips were right next to hers while their breath overlapped. Right then, time seemed to have ceased. They could see nothing else but each other. Clay stared at the pretty girl, her charming eyes and rosy lips. His Adam's apple rolled once while he felt some uncontrollable impulse that led to an unexpected action. He lowered his head and placed a kiss upon her lips. It started gently but went vigorously when he felt her bewitching tenderness. Finally, he lost control. He pulled the girl into his arms and cuddled her tightly while lavishing endless kisses on her. Kimberly was not expecting such an immediately elevated encounter. They had only met once in California and were merely seeing each other for the second time after some online chatting, and they were unbelievably intimate now. But when love called, who could ever resist? The young man and woman indulged themselves in caressing in the narrow lane. When kissing her, Clay realized how badly he had been longing for her. There was only one thing he wanted in the world, to be with her for the rest of his life. After his visit to New York City, Clay successfully made Kimberly his girlfriend. But due to other business, he could only stay for two days in New York before he flew back to California. They agreed that they would live together in California in the future and that Clay would wait for her to settle her business in New York and then take her home to his parents. Ten days later, there came the check. Connor accompanied his wife to the hospital for a B ultrasonography. They saw the pregnant sac, the embryo, and even the fetal heart. The results came as a bigger surprise. It seemed that Megan was conceiving two babies instead of one. They were twins. Honey, I'm overwhelmed. It's like winning a double jackpot. Connor lifted his wife joyfully, made a few circles, and put her back onto the bed gently. He placed his ear onto her belly and listened carefully. They are probably no bigger than the size of a rice grain now. You won't hear anything. Megan laughed at him, the one who was already carried away by joy. I can feel them. They are waving and calling me daddy, Connor declared as if he indeed heard it. Nonsense. Megan dabbed on his forehead and smiled contentedly. Come on, let's go back and tell them the good news, Connor smiled as they left the hospital. And as expected, the family members were all happy to hear the news. The elders finally would get to have an heir to their family. And two at the same time. Ever since Linda had learned about Megan's pregnancy, she asked them to move back to the Wilson mansion. Since Connor had to work that day, Linda could help take care of Megan. Even though Megan rejected it at first, Connor mentioned that it would be better to live with his parents and Megan finally agreed to it. And ever since Megan moved into the Wilson mansion, Linda had been giving her all sorts of herbs and nutritious foods, so much that Megan had different foods every day. You don't really have to do this for me. I can eat what I usually eat, Megan said as she looked at the chicken soup that had been prepared for her. No way. You have two babies in your belly now. You need all the nutrients you can get, Linda scolded. 
Even though Linda seemed close to Megan now, she still understood that her daughter-in-law still had some reservations about her, and she knew she was alone was the one to blame for that. Don't worry, I'm doing this for you and the baby's good. I won't try to hurt you again, Linda said wholeheartedly while holding Megan's hands. I hope you can forgive me for what I did to you in the past, and I swear I will treat you as my own daughter from this day onward. I know that your mother passed away at an early age, so you can treat me as your own mother if you want to. To show her sincerity, Linda took out a few antiquities and handed them to Megan. These are for you, as an apology for the wrongdoings I've done to you. There was no way Megan could accept such expensive gifts, and she refused them politely. Keep them, Linda insisted. Think of them as gifts for the babies. Megan could feel that Linda had changed a lot and she had no reason to not let the past go anymore. Then thank you, Megan said. Have some rest, I'll leave now, Linda said, and try to get back up, but sat back down instantly from the pain in her back. What's wrong? Megan asked. Nothing, I have some problems with my lumbar disc because of my age. Linda had lumbar disc herniation, which sometimes would cause intense pain to her back and leg. Are you feeling pain in your leg? Let me help you with that. Megan suggested, since she had the spare time. Linda already knew that Megan was proficient in acupuncture since she had helped treat Connor's leg problem. But I've had this problem for quite some time. Can it still be cured? Linda asked. Unfortunately, no, Megan explained. Acupuncture can't cure it, but it can at least help subdue the pain. And with that, Megan helped Linda with her problem with acupuncture and moxibustion. After a week of treatments every other day, Linda no longer felt numb or cold on the side of her thigh, and the pain was greatly reduced. She could hang out with her girlfriends again in malls and saloons. When someone asked, how is your leg? Linda answered with pride, it's all good now. My daughter-in-law cured me. Wow, isn't your daughter-in-law an actress? Is she also a doctor? Indeed, my daughter-in-law knows a lot. She's an actress. She plays violin. She has great culinary skills. And she even knows about healing. She is impressive. Your son has found a true treasure. No doubt, my daughter-in-law is a real gem. Now Linda had something else to show off. She talked about her wonderful daughter-in-law whenever she went. She had not thought highly of Megan previously, but after getting to know her better, she realized how wonderful this girl was. No wonder her son loved her so much. In the second month of Megan's pregnancy, Olivia came back to New York after their visit to James's family. The two girls cuddled upon seeing each other. Olivia smiled and said, This is great. Since you told me over the phone, I have been so happy for you and Mr. Wilson. It's wonderful that our Kai will have some company. And more than one, there are two. Megan, you're a hero. Don't make fun of me. How about you? How was your trip to James's home? Megan was fairly bored of staying at home and would very much like some stories from the outside world. His family was great. They were really kind to me, treated me as their real daughter-in-law, and Kai as their real grandson. They were so caring that I even felt guilty. <laughs> Don't be. You should feel grateful to your son. No kidding. They insisted on changing his surname and registering him to their household, so now Edward will take his surname. What should we do? What do you mean? There's only one syllable less. No big deal. Megan thought to herself, you will be husband and wife sooner or later. Why would it matter whose surname the kid takes? With one syllable missing, it makes all the difference. James is still young. We would be such a burden to him. At this age, he should be looking for a decent wife and having his own kid, but I wrecked it. Olivia sighed. She couldn't help thinking that she had dragged James into this, but she never knew that for James, she was never a burden. He was more than happy. He regarded Kai as his own flesh. If Olivia would not tell, he would never mention it for the rest of his life. Instead, he would only strive to be a good father. And if possible, he would be a good husband too. Towards the end of their conversation, Olivia asked, When are you getting married? Soon. You will be my bridesmaid then. Great. I've been longing for it. 
The date was set to be during the Labor Day holidays. Megan and Connor eventually agreed with the elders to hold the grand wedding. Then they started sending out invitations. When Layla received the wedding invitation in Hawaii, she felt like she was being granted a grand amnesty. Hallelujah. She could finally leave Hawaii. It would be nice to get away on a tropical island for a brief vacation. But to stay there forever and be haunted by someone like Woody, she was almost driven crazy. Therefore, Layla brought her ticket and flew back immediately upon receiving the wedding invitation from her brother. She snuck away without even telling Woody. Layla sat happily in the business class seat as she had finally managed to get rid of Woody. But the happiness only lasted for three minutes as a man with sunglasses and a suitcase sat down beside her. That's really bad of you, Layla. How could you leave without telling me? Woody complained. Why are you here? Layla scolded as she moved back a little as if she had seen a ghost. My job is to protect you. I have to follow you anywhere you go, Woody explained. My God, Layla screamed as she dropped her head down. How annoying can this guy be? Woody looked at the woman who treated him as some weirdo, and he was hurt by it. He couldn't help but reminisce about the Layla who was always by his side. How much he wished that she was still that Layla and not the person who hated him like he was a fly. As Layla was on her way back to New York, Connor had already arranged for Xavier to pick Jesse and Liam up. Jesse had been hiding in another country. No matter how hard Xavier and Chester searched for her, they couldn't find her. Connor was the one who found his sister first, and he did not force her to go back home. But now that he was about to get married, it was natural that he would invite his sister. That was the reason why he arranged Xavier to go and fetch her back. Jessie woke up in her place in a southern country and prepared breakfast for her son. Liam woke up after he caught the smell of a good breakfast. He went to the kitchen and greeted his mother. Mommy... Jessie turned and said, Give me a few minutes. The breakfast will be done soon. Mommy, why are you making breakfast every day now? Liam asked. I thought Daddy said he would take care of it, and you can be the queen of the family. Chester's face flashed through Jessie's mind upon her son's mention of him. He had made that promise to Jessie in the past that he would love her and take care of her, that she could be his queen, and because he loved her too much, she could not live on her own. Not to mention, she had to take care of her son on her own, too. As Jessie thought about it, she burnt the fifth sunny-side-up egg that she was preparing and gave up. Mommy, don't cry, Liam comforted as he noticed his mother was about to cry. Let's go find Daddy. He can make sure that we won't starve. But it only made the situation worse for Jessie as she turned and hugged her son. They already had no home to go back to. Let's go home. I miss Grandpa and Grandma and Patrick and Alice, too. Since Liam was still a little kid, he could not understand why his mother would choose to live in a small house in a place that he never knew of. He could not understand why he was forbidden from calling his father and why his father never came for them. The little one has been gone from New York for too long, and he began to miss it. Jesse suddenly remembered the invitation from Connor to his marriage, and if her memory served her right, the wedding would be held on the day after tomorrow. Therefore, she wiped away her tears and told her son, Well, Mom will pack our things and take you back to New York for Uncle's wedding. Really? Great. Yeah, we are going home. Liam sprang with joy. Jessie went to her room to pack. Soon she came out with a huge suitcase. She took her son to set off, but upon opening the door, she saw a man standing outside. Jessie lost one breath when seeing it was Xavier. How could he find me here? Liam found Xavier as a pleasant surprise. Uncle, how come you're here? Uncle came to bring Liam home, Xavier said with a smile as he bent down and patted on Liam's head. Great. Mom and I are already packed. We are ready. Liam couldn't wait to go home. Xavier glanced at Jesse and took over her suitcase without asking. Then he lifted Liam and said, Let's go, Liam. Let's go, let's go. Liam clapped his little hands cheerfully and turned to his mom. Hurry up, Mom. Although Jesse was not ready to confront Xavier, she had to face it sooner or later. She followed them submissively. Xavier drove them back to New York. 
When they got out of the car in front of the Wilson mansion, Chester suddenly showed up and stopped Jesse. Finally, you're back. I've been waiting for you. Upon seeing Chester, Xavier stood in front of Jesse and blocked Chester from approaching further. Jesse looked at Chester emotionlessly, as if he was a stranger. The look shot him in the heart. He had been looking hopelessly for her for such a long while. Knowing that Connor was getting married, he reasoned that being his eldest sister, she would definitely come for the ceremony. But he was not expecting that she would show up with Xavier. Xavier found Jesse ahead of him. Are they together now? Thinking of that, Chester felt restless yet helpless. Realizing that his ex-wife would never speak to him, Chester turned to his son instead. Come to Daddy Liam. Daddy missed you so much after such a long while. Xavier was holding his hand, but upon seeing his dad, Liam got rid of Xavier immediately and ran into Chester's arms. Daddy, I missed you so much too. Until then, Chester had felt distinctively how badly he missed his son and how important his son was to him. Who would ever care about blood ties? He raised Liam for seven years. How profoundly bonded they were. Come on, Liam, let's get inside. Jesse did not want to spare any chance for Chester. She came and took Liam towards the Wilson mansion. Chester was reluctant and wanted to follow, but Xavier blocked his way. You are not worthy of it. Go away and do not come for them again. Otherwise, I won't be so nice. Upon issuing the warning, Xavier went into the house, leaving Chester standing speechlessly outside. He could only watch them going away and did not dare to take a further step. He was indeed no longer worthy of it. Chester understood that he was in the wrong. Not only had he ruined a once happy family, he had also lost his wife and son in the process. At that moment, the only thing he wanted was to get them back and beg for their forgiveness, but he wondered if he would ever have the chance to do so. Susan went back to New York the day before the wedding after she has fully recovered. All three of Connor's sisters gathered at the mansion ready for the wedding. Megan also returned to the Jing mansion to prepare for the wedding. I don't know why, but I feel like something bad is about to happen, Megan said when she called Connor. It felt too quiet for Megan. It was as if it was the calm before the storm. You must be paranoid about the wedding. Everything will be fine once it's over, Connor comforted. I really do hope so. I'm really afraid that a person might do something in the dark. Megan expressed her worries as she recalled what had happened to Layla and Susan. Don't worry, the whole of New York is alerted right now. No terrorist can enter this city that easily. To make sure the wedding would proceed smoothly, Connor had already arranged for a few of his mercenaries to protect the city. Should we just cancel the wedding? Megan asked. Megan would not mind if the wedding were not held, as the thing she wanted the most at that moment was for her family to be safe. It's too late to cancel it. The invitation has already been sent out. I promise to give you a grand wedding, and I'm not planning to go back on my word. Connor showed that his will to marry Megan would never waver, no matter what happened. All right, fine. Get some good rest. You're going to be my beautiful bride tomorrow. Megan had only slept for a few hours when the dress-up artist came to her place. The bridesmaids, which consisted of Olivia, Samantha, Lily, and Kimberly, were all waiting for Megan in their traditional dresses. When Megan came out in her bright red dress, it shocked the whole crowd. Oh my, you're so pretty. You look like you can be an empress in the past. I really can't wait to see what Mr. Wilson will be wearing. Everything was prepared, and according to the tradition, Xavier helped his niece on to the wedding carriage. The carriage was three meters tall and needed ten people to carry it. With the carriage, the band, and everything else, the group that marched towards the Wilson mansion was two kilometers long. The wedding had attracted almost everyone onto the street to witness the traditional marriage between the two biggest families in New York. A grand door, retro style, bridal sedan drove by. Through the swaying rosy gauze, people could vaguely see the bride wearing a veil and sitting upright inside. Although they couldn't see her face, they were already very well informed of her unsurpassed beauty. The bridal procession passed by major streets in New York and many journalists were broadcasting the spectacular scene.
The roads from Lee Mansion to the Wilson Mansion were closed. All other vehicles had to detour. The bridal procession walked all the way towards the entrance of the Wilson Mansion. Every corner in the Wilson Mansion was dressed up in red. All the red carpets, red silk decorating flowers, and red lamps were demonstrating the joyfulness. People gathered around the mansion to witness the ceremony. The servants in the mansion also joined the crowd. The three sisters were all present. They stood by the entrance and got excited upon the sight of the bridal procession. They are here. The bridal sedan is coming. Layla lifted her dress and ran into the courtyard. Come on, groom. Your bride is here. Coming. A lofty figure came out of the house. Connor was wearing a black and red silk gown embroidered with curling dragons and clouds and a purple golden crown. The tassels flew on both sides of the gown while he walked imposingly and gracefully. He came like an esteemed emperor arriving at his court. He was holding his daughter Alice in hand to welcome the bride together. Alice was also dressed in a jubilant, ancient, styled costume. It seems like a delicate little fairy was walking out of an ancient painting. The tall and small figures walked along the red carpet and were immediately surrounded by journalists. Look at Mr. Wilson. How handsome. The little girl is so cute. What a good looking family they are. I feel like I'm witnessing an emperor's wedding ceremony back in an ancient time. The little girl was the most excited. Upon seeing the bridal sedan, Alice sprang in joy and cheered, Daddy, look, such a beautiful car. Is Mommy there? Yes, she is. Connor bent slightly and patted her on her head. You will come inside with Mommy and Daddy shortly. No prob. Fireworks were set off and the bridal sedan finally stopped. Megan was escorted out of the sedan. When she stepped onto the ground, she found her legs being cuddled by someone immediately. Looking down from beneath the veil, she saw the smiling face of her daughter. Mommy, you are so pretty. Megan pointed on her little nose and walked along the red carpet, guided by her daughter, until the man in the wedding gown appeared in front of her. Connor was holding his smile. He came to her, placed one end of the red silk into her hand, and led her into the Wilson mansion. Following the traditions, they came all the way to the main hall, where the three elders were sitting up. An MC walked them through the traditional wedding. Connor and Megan made obeisance to the elders and formally got married. Megan was escorted into the bridal chamber, and a feast was hosted in the courtyard of Wilson Mansion. Right in the middle of the cheerful ceremony, no one was expecting a thundering bomb. Bang! People were terrified and started running around. Get down! Connor sensed the danger and called out to the crowd. Bang! Another bomb exploded right under the table where Connor's parents sat. The table and people around were blown away. The entire Wilson mansion went into an emergency alert because of the bombings. Members of the JS group started searching for the attacker immediately. That's it for today, guys. If you want to inspire me more, you can buy me a puppy. Thank you for listening.